There we are. Right, so these are the big, big concrete house printing machines that you can purchase for a mere, well, it doesn't say. Oh, start at 180,000 euros. You can buy a house for that. Uh, but you can build several houses with this once you've done it. Most customers' big buying prints are in the range of 300,000 to 500,000 euros. You can request a price list here. So, <laughs> I'm sure we all want one of those. <laughs> I'll go back to this other one. So that's where that came from. Peter, can I ask about the insulation qualities of concrete? You can. Or Who are you going to ask, though? It's going to be, as somebody said, poor. Yes. Yes, they've got, uh, didn't we have some links to a system where they incorporated insulation within the concrete? So that was a sort of triple layer, I believe. Um, anyway, uh, that'll make it weaker, of course. So here we are. Oh, one's been constructed. Um, oh, where's it gone? I saw a picture just then. Oh, there it is. There it is. There's humans there for scale. Yes, interesting. Now that's pure concrete with no visionary reinforcement. How do they feed the concrete into the printer? Well, it comes up from the from your truck up this tube along here and down there. I suppose they don't show you little details like that, do they? Well, if you were building a high high level car park, you use the uh, pumps on the barrels that they bring the concrete in. Yeah, well, they just have to pump it up. Yeah, them. I suppose so. Yeah. Uh, hmm? Yep. Um, let's move on. I think. Uh, let's just. Oh, this is a nice. Germany's first three D printed house. Hmm. hmm. Well, that looks better. Yes. That looks yeah. like it. Is that a mock-up or is it real? Well, it's, they look like real trees and a car stuck there and things and a bush here, so and table in there. Look, just that the house doesn't look real. I know it doesn't, does it? And, and there's Strange no there's no overlap here, does there? <laughs> Strange no pattern shadows. on the wall as well. It's what? Strange pattern on the wall. I think that's just because of the size I've got it. If I just do Control Plus. Whoops, and lose it all, yes. Where else it got to now? Oh, it's not that one, it must be up. Still pattern, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll go back on the same magnification, wherever that's got to now. There we are. So, there's that one, and then there's the Office of the Future. And the, uh, this funny one down here, I think. I can't say I thought much of that. <laughs> but it's stunning, and it's futuristic. <laughs> it beats you over the head. That's why it's stunning. <laughs> and this one, SQ4D releases a first 3D printed home for sale. Hmm. Right, and in the USA. And it, oh. they're, quote, they're quoting these prices, but you don't know how they relate to a normal construction. Properties. No, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm just, it's just an article about it. I'm just, uh, anyway. Um, this has got an auto autonomous robotic construction system, uh, low power consumption technology. They're still feeling their way with this system, of course. So that's why it's all a bit vague. Um, but if it can do, a f do it in 48 hours, amazing. Um, just a different tool. It's still the same product. We can make things more affordable. So we can use technology to tackle homelessness in aid of disaster relief in an eco-friendly way. So, ah, Gaia, Ita Italy, a thousand pounds, a thousand dollars, amazing. Hmm. Hmm. What it's like yet, it might be a chicken hatch. Well, yes, <laughs> a mixture of concrete and mud. <clears throat> 215 square feet, took 10 days to complete, although the total time when accounting for all the furnishings would be longer. The most extraordinary part is it costs just a thousand dollars in materials. Aha. Uh -huh. mm, right. And it looks like that. Interesting. Hmm? You could land a helicopter on that one. Yeah, well I had I don't think the roof is printed somehow. 
But anyway, interesting, different. And then there's yet more. You see, it goes on and on. This website page. Um, <clears throat> Eindhoven building five, three. There's five 3D printed condos. Right. Project milestone. Um, five habitable and beautifully shaped houses in Eindhoven. Hmm. Hmm. We could look at that, I suppose. What that looks like. It goes here. It doesn't this look? Doesn't show, is that what they are like? Well, that's Project Milestone, isn't it? Yes, well, you can look at that yourselves later on. Just get rid of that one and that one. Back to Project, this one here. <clears throat> Pioneered a solution to the shortage of skilled bricklayers in the Netherlands. Hmm. Uh, they're currently... yeah, I was going to ask you, Richard, what you thought of this this funny Czech one here that looks like that. <laughs> Floating. Yeah, and I asked you, how long do you think that would last? And it was at that point I realised uh, yeah, I didn't get a response. <laughs> Well, I assume it's a bit built a bit like a concrete stone. But I presume the windows are like lenses. Yeah, it looks like a camera, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, you could, if you were um, uh, playing a, sort of like a pinhole camera, yes. It would, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you could make a camera big enough, you could live in a camera, couldn't you? Big, a lens big enough, yes. Right, number 12. I've got another one that's going on here. I don't know what that, uh, that looks like that. Uh, that doesn't look very attractive, does it? No. But it's recycled concrete. Um, using the debris from demolition sites. Mm. They can then be recycled after the building has been demolished. Yes, I suppose it's a good idea, isn't it? Um, they just put it through a crusher, don't they? And crush it all up into small particles. Yeah. Well, they normally just use it for filling up roads or something, don't they? Yes, indeed. So how much does it cost? And here's a bit about costs. I think we're near the bottom of it. When will they be available? They're already available, arguably, it says. Hmm. It's showing what the cost was, but you went past it. I oh, think. right. I'm so sorry. I do apologize. Right there, 170,000. Yes. 20% more. was roughly 20% than traditional methods of cost. Right. So it costs more, does it, Well, that's what that would imply. That's a funny sentence, that, isn't it? Yeah, it's not English. We don't know what the quantity is trying to say. Was it roughly 20% more or it should less. Be the more or less in that space? Oh, dear. It was a French-built house, so it was probably French people who dictated that bit. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, careful, careful. We haven't got any French people with us, have we? No, no. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, anyway, um, they are available. Can you print your own? Yes, of course you can. So you just download a bit of software. Here you are, some software you can download to build your own. How about that? Let's have a look at that over here. So I should come up here. The best architect software. That looks a familiar page. So anyway, I think it's the same website. The 10 best arch architecture software beginner and expert. Well, there you go, look at that. Again, big white spaces. Um, it's, it's the same site, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is, yes. I recognise all that. Yeah. I wonder why they don't have the... I can't see any other controls. Anyway, right, well, we'll move on, I think. Uh, to the, we haven't got to the... That's only the first thing we're doing, isn't it, at the moment? Where's my list? I've got my list here still. So the next one is... Oh, that's interesting, yes. If I hadn't already got it open, what's, I think this might be it. This is a bit like the one you had. Is that, is that the one? Oh, that's just adverts. Just adverts, forget that. How do we get rid of the adverts? Wait for the finish. <laughs> I'm going to get it to stop. <laughs> oh, made it. One of the problems with having the solar panels on the roof, they only work during the day, so there must be a lot of batteries somewhere. Uh, maybe, yeah. Right, that's my, probably right. Now, what? Moving on from that. That was just a bit more uh, of the house 
inside the house and how it worked, Diana. I don't know whether you noticed, had that before. Yeah, I, I was listening to that. Yeah. Well, there's a link for that in there. So the next one on my system is to do with all the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. You're I'm sure you all want to know about that. You're not sharing. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Where is it? Come back to come back. I thought I was sharing. It's funny the way it sort of works and doesn't work. I have to, I've got two whole control to select multiple windows. It says. So I'm doing that. I'm clicking share. No. Oh, it's gone into share now. You are there. Yes, there's an online encyclopedia of integer sequences. Well, would you believe it? I mean, who wants to know? <laughs> One wonders. Um, is it online? It's created by the maintenance of Royal Researching A and E, A, T, and T. Um, records information on integer sequences of interest to professional amateur mathematicians as of january 2022 it contains over 350,000 sequences making really that's something like pi then is it well uh, well you can have a look at some of them in a minute there's also non-integers i notice um it's making life uh, interesting special meaning of zero uh there's a lot to this this is a, just a window um a wikipedia thing but i thought it was interesting um i didn't know about these things um, so if it, if it, perhaps it ought to go straight to uh, some of the proper ones, I think. Um, well, self-referential sequences. And let's look at non-integers, shall we just see what they're all about? Oh. Besides integers, there are non-integers. Yes. Transcendental numbers, complex numbers, transforming, into, into, uh, transforming them into integer sequences. Sequences of fractions are represented by two sequences named with the keyword frac. The sequence of numerators and the sequence of denominators. I see. For example, fifth order fairy sequence, one fifth, one fourth, one third, two fifths, etc., is catalogued as the numerator one, sequence one, 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 two, one, three, two, three, four. That's the clearest crystal, isn't it? <laughs> and then five, four, I see, just the bottom lines. Uh, that's why of cataloguing, that's all. Irra irrational numbers such as pi are catalogued under representative integer sequences as decimal expressions. Here, three and one and, and so on, forever. <laughs> Goodness me. Or can all continued fractions such as three, comma, seven. What, where does the seven come from? 15. Hmm. I don't understand that, do you? Um, no. No. <laughs> it's as clear as the concrete they were building those houses from. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anyway, it was limited to ASCII text until 2011 and still uses a linear form of conventional mathematical notation, such as F bracket N for functions, N for running variables. Greek letters usually represented by the full names, it, for example, mu, instead of mu. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> every sequence is identified by letter A, followed by six digits. I like these up at the top. <clears throat> always referring to the, it was referred to with the leading zeros. Yes, I see. Special meaning of zero. Uh, non-existence uh, for example a one odilium uh, enumerates the smallest prime of n squared consecutive primes to form n times n magic square at least magic well it's all mathematical ain't it <laughs> as one might say and they've got lexicographical ordering of sequences um so each sequence has a predecessor and a successor <laughs> um <laughs> um uh, OEIS normalizes the sequences for lexicographical ordering, ignoring all initial zeros and ones, and also the side of each element. Sequences of weight distribution codes often omit periodically recurring zeros. Does that make any sense to anybody? No. No, not me. 
No, well, perhaps this is a perhaps this is a step too far. This one. <laughs> I mean, this this word here, uh, I looked at and thought, well, I've saw there's a um, somebody called Dirich or something in the past, a mathematician, but I can't remember. So let's shall we move on to a different one? I think we're better. Um, time is pressing on. Ah, oh, this this thing I thought was interesting. The, it's a it's hango bone. Discovered by fishermen, uh, the fishermen settlement of Hisango in the Democratic Republic of Congo. A bone tool and possibly a mathematical device dating from the Upper Paleolithic. Isn't that extraordinary? Um, the curved brown, uh, bone is dark brown, 10 centimetres only in length. The picture Can of you it. remind me, piece of what the Upper Paleolithic era was when? Of course we can. There you are. Late Stone Age, the third and last subdivision of the Old Stone Age, or Paleolithic. Very broadly, it dates from 50,000 to 12,000 years ago. So it's quite recent, you see, he said. Yeah. Um, OK. Yeah, Wikipedia is very good at that, isn't it? Um, anyway, so it's only 10 centimetres long and features a sharp piece of quartz affixed to one end, possibly for engraving. Because it's been narrowed, scraped, polished and engraved to a certain extent, it's no longer possible to determine what animal the bone belonged to. <laughs> um, so, yes, you, you can't really tell much from this picture. It's a bit too small, but there are markings on there, which you can see in a moment. The ordered engraving. Sorry? Oh, you could have done a DNA sample and just show what sort of bone it was from. I know, I would have thought so. Anyway. Um, led to many speculations about the meanings of the marks, including the interpretation of um, like <coughs> significance or astrological relevance, which is thought by some to be a tally stick. Um, there are three columns running the length of the tools, though it has also been suggested the scratches might have been created a better grip on the handle <laughs> for some non mathematical reason. Oh, sorry about that. Um, other, others argue the marks on the object are non-random and it's likely to be a kind of counting tool used to perform simple mathematical procedures. Let's go on about that a bit. Um, and then, dating 20,000 years before the present, uh, the, the oldest mathematical tool known to mankind, humankind, with the possible exception of the 40,000-year-old Lebombo bone. You see, you're missing out all these wonderful things in the world. <laughs> Um, made of baboon fibula. It knows that one. Um, I expect we could have a look at that if you wanted later on. Let's have a look. I'm sure there's some pictures here. Um, that's when it was found. Oh, these are some of the marks we have on the bone. Uh, actually, if we look at the, if we go back to the picture, I think we can get a bigger picture of it here. Can we not? Maybe even bigger still. Um, I'm sure there's a way of getting it bigger, isn't it? Oh, yeah, that, maybe? No, that doesn't work. Or maybe this one? I know that's just the thing for getting to, yes. Oh, sorry about that. A diversion didn't really help, did it? Um, I've lost it now. Come back! All is forgiven! Ah! Oh. I have to go back and load it again, won't I? Which is a matter of doing that. Is it going to... Uh, it worked, yes. Right, can you say it again? Yes. Sorry about that. Right. So that was the finding date and interpretations. That's what we're on at the moment. That's what these are all about. <clears throat> 168 edgings on the bone are ordered in three parallel columns along the length of the bone, each marking with a varying orientation and length. The first column or central column along the most curved side of the bone is referred to as the M column, which is French for milieu. There you go. Okay, the first one is seven. As far as I can see, there's eight pieces, or is it broken by accident? Uh, oh, I see. Uh, the one there. Uh, yes, it's probably accident, that, or something, or it's missing, or something. I don't know. Um, why is that? Five doesn't work out right either, does it? Well, if you just ignore the... the straight oh, yeah then what's this for but what's this plus four well that's the, that's the next box i presume 
They're trying to figure out what it all means, these particular random, apparently random marks. Yes. Hmm. So this one is, what, nine? Is it two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? And a little bit. Two bits that are at a different angle, this. Yes, yes. Oh, goodness me. There's another nine down here as well. Yeah, I think they're being a bit optimistic here, to be quite honest. Could it, could it not just be a kid whittling a piece of wood? Yeah. Making random See, marks? I've seen those I was thinking that. You, you pessimists, you lot of you pessimists. Look at this wonderful, wonderful organisation. Someone's got to figure it out. But it is. It could well be that. Um, um, archaeological meanings, cautionary tales. Right. <laughs> well, it's important to attempt to identify the potential meaning. Uh, it is. It is vital to not become wrapped up in dubious hypotheses. Okay. <laughs> Well, two of us are not getting wrapped up in it. <laughs> I see. You want me to move on then? <laughs> I'm sure it's 11 o'clock and we've only done two or three, haven't we? Uh, where was that? Was the, I was moved to that side, right? I'll move it back into this right place, I think. Anyway, so we've looked at that one. I'm looking at this one next, I think. Ah, yes. This is about... Um, this I thought was fascinating. This um, nuclear fusion as opposed to fission. It's come around, well, they've managed to do it with lasers and magnets. Um, the first British outfit's first light fusion claims to have achieved nuclear fusion with an approach that could provide cheap, clean power. Rather than rely on expensive lasers, complicated optical gear and magnetic fields, as some fusion reactors do, um, the first light's equipment consists instead shoots a tungsten projectile out of a gas-powered gun at a target dropped into a chamber. Uh, we're told it's a fully working reactor. This high-speed projectile will hit the moving target, which contains a small deuterium fuel capsule that implodes on impact. This rapid implosion causes the fuel's atoms to fuse, which releases a pulse of energy. The fusion energy can be absorbed by lithium flowing through the chamber, goodness, which runs through a heat exchanger to boil water into steam that uh, spins a turbine to turn a generator to produce electricity. The projectile would fire would be fired every 30 seconds. So here you are. You can watch the visualisation of this in this thing below. Did you know they were actually expanding the CERN uh, thing by you know, doubling the size of it? Yeah, I did think I heard that, yes. Anyway, let's look at this little video. I don't think it will take long. 32 seconds, in fact. Yes, that's where the projectile comes from, I think. Well, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. that was a plate, wasn't it? That they move in and out. And then they blast it into there. Phew, bang. Yes, that must be the projectile at the top. And then they, then they put another one in from the top. Another plate slides in and fires down, and off it goes again. Weird, isn't it? Peter, can you explain where you'd get liquid lithium from? <coughs> uh, me? Well, you want me to do that? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you rub somebody's leaf car and extract their batteries. I don't know. <laughs> it's a dangerous procedure, though, I can tell you that. Um, anyway, here are well, the test projectile reaches 1,454, 540 miles per hour before hitting the target. Hmm. It's extraordinary to think that you can produce power like that, doesn't it? I think. Just using a bullet, basically. Um, it's it's a plate in which it stops, presumably. It generates the energy. Uh, no, it said it was the implosion that did that, wasn't it? Yeah, but it, what makes it implode? I mean, surely it's when it hits something, it's... If it's already going at what one thousand five four hundred mile an hour, when it hits something, it's bound to actually generate heat, isn't it? And isn't that what they're talking about? Well, it says a pulse of energy. Yeah, you tell me. When it goes, the fusion energy can be absorbed by lithium, um, which runs through the chamber. 
it's, as I say, it's extraordinary. <laughs> um, I was looking. So, in this test shot, the projectile reached a speed of six point five kilometers. Right. Oh, that's fifteen meters. Did it say high? Subscribe to it if you want. Um, splat. Fires in there, implodes, and you tell me what that's supposed to mean. I think the bottom uh, was uh, was lithium, the liquid lithium. Yeah, perhaps you're right. Anyway, right, so, okay. Um, Peter, I'm afraid I've got to go now, but thank you very much for organising this, and uh, see you next time, I hope. I'm sorry it wasn't, really... sorry it wasn't quite as smooth as it should have been. <laughs> okay. Bye, bye everybody. Bye. Bye, bye. 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 Um, right. Um, see if there's any more on this. Can't remember. Simplicity. Being simple, we believe it could be the fastest path to commercially viable power generation from fusion. Ah. Yeah, it comes out of Oxford University. Hmm. There's a bit more to it, as you can see, to this article. A lot more to it, in fact. Um, it talks about tritium and so on. The deuterium deuterium fusion reaction can produce a stable helium isotope. In a, where did that come from? Um, the complex geometry of the target. Ah. Secret source. Is that the right spelling of source? I like that. So, um, we don't know what the target looks like. That'll be just any old target. Um, this is your famous uh, uh, site, Richard, called the Register. Yes, indeed, I noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the deuterium, deuterium, what's it got to do with deuterium, deuterium, all of a sudden? Hmm. Hmm. Oh, I say so far they've tr achieved deuterium deuterium fusion. So, are we so ah, I see what they're saying is those are the materials for which the target is made. Um, and unlike the deuterium fuel, tritium is radioactive uh, and is a byproduct. First light wants to keep to a minimum. Oh, I see, yet produce enough to aid the fusion in the chamber. One of the biggest engineering challenges is to produce enough tritium so the reaction is self-sufficient. Um, Half-life of 12 years, it is the biggest safety hazard, but only 12 years. Hmm. We can minimise levels to as low as 100 grams. Hmm. Right. Uh, they're, they're talking about torus things as well. There's another step sideways. <laughs> In this experiment, first light said it was able to produce 50 neutrons from deuterium fusion. That's all. Um, said the amount of energy released was very little. It was working to increase the number of neutrons by 1,000 times in its next big run. Mm, yes, before technology can be used in people's homes, first light's equipment needs to achieve a fusion reaction capability of emitting a quintillion of, of neutrons. 10 to the 18. Without the use of expensive lasers and magnets, First Light believes its technology will be comparable to renewables in terms of cost. It could reach under $50 per megawatt hour. Is that cheap? Um, $50 per megawatt hour. Hmm. It will a while before it happens, it says. <laughs> ah. Well, there you go. 148 comments about that, if you wish to look at that. Are you all still there, by the way? I'm just... I, I uh, worry. Yeah. I, I can't only hear nothing. I worry. Uh. <laughs> you could be talking to yourself, couldn't you? Exactly, exactly. That's what I thought I was... I did. I was at one time today. today. <laughs> um, this is another one about storing solar energy here. This is what you want, Richard, in your, um, what was it, the, uh, what are these? In the solar panels. Yes, exactly, yes. Um, 
So it stores solar energy for years and then releases it on demand. A, a liquid system. I thought that was a brilliant idea. Um, Isn't that uh, the same as putting the um, salt underneath your house and storing the heat in the salt bath? Oh, there was this, is that another one, isn't it? Yes. Um, that was, is this that, this one? So, da, 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 da. Well, well, this is a different one, isn't it? By well, hooking it to an ultra-thin thermoelectric generator, the team has now demonstrated it can produce electricity. Uh, a development it believes lays the groundwork for self-charging electronics that use solar power on demand, called the Molecular Solar Thermal System, or most. Hmm. The technology has been has been in the works for more than a decade. Hmm. Some of these things take a long time, don't they? Indeed. The energy captured by the most systems can be stored in this liquid state for up to 18 years. How about that? For a specially designed catalyst returns the molecule to its original shape and releases the energy as heat. Well, this sounds particularly sensible and it's easy. Now, collaborated with China, China's Shanghai somebody, or university, to have used a compact thermoelectric generator to turn to turn that heat into electricity. The generator is an ultra-thin chip that will be integrated into electronics such as headphones, smartwatches and telephones. What? So far we've only generated small events of electricity, but new results show the concept really works. What's that? Ah. So there's the liquid energy. Mm. Mm. So that's one solution, isn't it, Richard? Yeah, if it works, I don't necessarily believe that, but I need to read that in more detail than you're going through. It, <laughs> yes, of course. I'm going rapidly through it, of course. Just showing you what's available and around. This is extraordinary, though, I find that. Um, do you know, recently, Richard, the number of interesting uh, reports and articles has dropped dramatically in the last week or so. It seems yes, to me. indeed. Well, it seems to be a month or so for me, but yes, you're right. Anyway, uh, I thought this was in the last month, and I thought it was interesting enough to show you. Um, this is a radically new way of generating electricity for so from solar energy. It means we can use solar energy to produce electricity regardless of the weather, time of day, season, or geographical location. A closed system that can operate without causing carbon dioxide emissions. So, and now focusing on improving its importance, etc. Uh, improving its performance. Uh, yeah, what, the streamline? Yes, it sounds interesting. Indeed. So, have another read of it, Richard. And this, I will. And this is another, oh, this is new Atlas one. This um, laser mark finds trial, finds dominating blood lowers PFAs forever. Whatever PFAs are. Anybody? Nobody know what a PFA is? No. Right, right. okay. Well, good. Um, at least it's not just me. <laughs> um, it's not going to tell you, does it? Oh, here we are. That's what they are. Plurifluoroalkylic substances. I'm not surprised you didn't know. <laughs> the first Australian, Australian clinical trial has found regular blood donations can reduce levels of the toxic PFAS chemicals in the blood by up to 30%. Well, that's that. So mine's already been reduced, has it? Having given blood. The trial is the first to find an effective intervention that reduces the level of substances known as forever chemicals. The, the perfluoro whatever um, are a group of manufacturing chemicals encompass, encompassing over 4,000 different specific compounds the PFAS can be found in a variety of household objects, from carpets to non-stick cookware. But perhaps the most is firefighting foams. Firefighters have been historically exposed to extraordinary levels of PFAS. A growing body of research has associated high blood levels, high blood levels of PFAS to a variety of adverse health effects, including obesity, liver and thyroid abnormalities, and repaired immune refunctions. So, uh, interesting recognition of PFAS toxicity has led to plenty of work 
removing chemicals from common products and decontaminating exposed environments. But until now, clinicians had no way to help those already exposed. Hmm. So that's what happens with you when you give blood. So all firefighters in Australia should give blood. <laughs> Isn't that right, <laughs> Diana? <laughs> Uh, if you say so. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, it's a logical um, extension of what they're saying here. It is. <clears throat> so we've got 285 so far. Yes, yes, yes. Not very many, but it's a good sample. <clears throat> Donating every 12 weeks for a year. more effective and conscious 30% decrease hmm yes oh, I'm yawning here um what to do with the donated blood oh that's the point but the elevated serum PFAS levels do not currently exclude someone from donating blood therefore currently is no specific threshold of PFAS contamination that would stop donated blood being distributed. Ah, right. So what happens then? Uh, oh yes, yes. All tricky stuff, isn't it? But blood authorities should continue to monitor the evidence of possible health effects of PFASs and consider the possible implication of elevated ones in blood donors. Elevated level. I thought it was meant to be reducing it. Hmm. Yes, I have to look. Well, I never really knew about those before. Now. <laughs> not me. Not me. Uh, but there's obviously a lot more to it. You can go to um, that, or even Macquarie University. Wherever is that? Somewhere near you? That's down in bit uh, near Melbourne. Right. I think. Yeah. Right. All right, let's move on to the next one, another new, uh, new Atlas one. Full night vision pocket camera. I thought this would do for us because it's a photographic one. I tried to get a few photographic ones in. Oh, I might have got this in twice. Um, so there's the camera and there's the lens, but it can turn night into day, it says here. And um, it's called a Duo Vox. It's a, a, a launch as a compact night vision camera. With a custom Sony sensor and advanced algorithms at its heart, bringing full colour experience to after dark, dark hikes in the mountains. Actually, Macquarie University is near Sydney. Oh, right, thank you. <laughs> I've just looked it up. Very interesting, you didn't know. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> uh, anyway. I, I did my uni stuff in England. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Anyway, this but ideal for you when you go mountaineering at night, <laughs> assuming you do. Uh, I do actually do that. Well, Many high mountains I've climbed have been in the night. So what you want is a Duovox Mate Pro camera, uh, apparently. <laughs> we have used low light. Da, 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 da. Um, let's allow Duovox to turn an entire night scene into full colour daylight daylit fo photograph. Um, uh. My new iPhone does a really good job of taking photos at night that look like they were taken almost in the day. Oh, I know what they do. They're very good. Cam mobile phones are very good. Well, this is another one. This is the, the, the actual scene with a mobile phone, perhaps. Maybe not. I don't know. Or oh, is that photographing the back of his camera? Maybe that's what it is. Yes, the clouds look good. In that particular picture so anyway um i should say this one eighth inch five megapixel sensor is written to be capable of capturing da, da, da. um in low, light as low as zero zero point zero 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 one lux it's hmm. quite low isn't it pick out the details in a moonless moonless overcast night and those images aren't in the familiar black and white many night vision cameras it outputs true colour. Where does it get the light from? Hmm. Anyway, they're both at f0.9 lens at the front. 22 stops of dynamic range. That's enormous, isn't it, Richard? It is indeed. 
Normally what, nine at the most? I have three cameras here. One is an infrared one. One is a night camera, which may be the same as this sort of thing. Um, and the, but the trouble is they all work on um, uh, whatever you call the thing you've got. As you're allowed to go out and buy. Um, what's the operating system? Uh, Windows? No. <laughs> no. No, 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 that's the problem. They work on one of the phone ones. What's the... Oh, Android. Android, yes. They've got to be Androids. Yes, right. I'm with you now. Yes, I remember. You, you brought that camera around here. Yes. I've also it. got another one, which is there. And that, that just... You, the light goes down that... Hold on. I'm just sw switching off and everything. I've only just switched off the sharing. Now, if I, if I pin you, you'll be... Oh, you will... Right, yeah. That, that's one of the other ones. That's a... Uh... That's one you can put down your stomach if you want to. <laughs> Just as if I would, yes. <laughs> that has got LEDs on it as well. It's very interesting. We do the illumination. Right, okay. Thank you. That's... All done with fiber optics. <laughs> right. I'll switch back now to sharing. Yeah, okay. Um, um, what's happened here? What's happened here? Oh, well. So it's a switch back for a start. Uh, Chrome. That's all done, that's done, we should be back, except we've got two on top of each other. Oh, interesting, you can see two, two screens at once there, one on top of the other. Right, um, so that was 22 stops, able to put out twice as much detail as an iPhone 13 Pro Max. Yeah, that's the one I've got. Well, there you go. Nothing cheap then, <laughs> about Diana. <laughs> Mine's not, a, I don't know if mine's a Max. But it's a 13 Pro. Right, okay. Um, yes, my daughter and granddaughter who are here have all both got iPhones. And uh, they are nice little things, but they're very small, the ones they've got. Um, mm, mine's not very big. Well, we've, well she's hired a, um, a, a car, which is um, a, uh, no, a Renault car. And it has a little well in the in in front of the the gear stick, which says you can put your phone in there and it will charge it up. Yeah, I, I do that in our car. Well, I can't do it with I couldn't do it with my phone because my phone's too big, it wouldn't fit in in this little well. So you've got to buy the, the a bigger car to get that in. Mm, yes, <laughs> this is what we well, we went up to um, the top of Glastonbury Tor last night, and. Um, so her phone was running down. She wanted to charge it up. And she found that it didn't work. When she got back here, it wasn't charged up. Despite all that journey. <laughs> back from Glastonbury Tor. So anyway, I've never been up there before. It's exciting up there, it was. I'm not sure where that is. Oh, it's near Glastonbury. Mm. Which is not far, just south of Wells. Um, I know Wells. Right. Western Supermail or Cheddar Gorge. Yeah, they're nearby as well. Anyway, there were a lot of people walking about barefoot up there on all these gravel things. And I asked one chap, does it hurt? I said, oh, no, it's hurt. No, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> he said with a grimace. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, um, here's the camera. Um, that's how big it is. Um, uh, Yes, I don't think it's the final product somehow. Anyway, so I thought that might be interesting. Move on mm. to the next one quickly. Um, oh, this is uh, this is about the same thing, Duovox. And this is their website. And this is what they put on their website, this funny picture here. So we, it can do night vision, 1,000 foot, 300 meter view distance, 2K full true color image. Four hour battery life and so on. Um, so they're claiming that will happen uh, at five megapixels and so on. So you can look at this one as well, it's just much the same. I can't say that I thought much of that in comparison of those two pictures, but perhaps that is the color of whatever it is down there. And uh, it can stay in focus for up to a thousand feet. That's what the thousand feet we're talking about, I think. The colour is only colour if you illuminate it with a, shall we say, a white 
source. Yeah, indeed, yes, that's right. So I was not being illuminated. You might be getting the light from anywhere, which can produce a false colour. I would have thought. I would think you're absolutely right. Anyway, it's it's a you know, sort of marketing gimmick. I have to realise. Of course. Yeah. It got an emergency flashlight. Very good. Yeah. So it's a, it's a camera that does more than most. Um, so how I, much is this camera? Oh, oh what a good question. Um, I don't suppose, Oh, look. Oh, there, well, that's your i13. No, it doesn't work at all in this time, uh, by comparison. There's that wolf there, although it's over here on the right to me. That again, that's a very strange comparison. Well, they're doing it on a video, aren't they? Yeah, yes, I know. So there you are. Um, fishing and boating. That's what you use it for. Um, some poor chap here struggling along. That's what you can see in the, with your eyes, and that's what the camera sees. Apparently, mm. a lot of the cameras here I, I can see more on the camera than I can with my eye. I haven't said that. Yes, yes, quite. Um, there's another one here the GoPro versus the this Matt Duo Vox, and that's a very good picture, isn't it? Compared to that, yes, indeed. But oh, I've got a price for. One of them, uh, two hundred and thirty dollars Australian dollars. Oh, the 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 disc camera. Um, well, it's a Geo Fox. Right, I see. Right, Mate Pro Night does, Photography. Does it have the price on here? I'm wondering. It's got all sorts of other things. That'd be a bit too much pain, wouldn't it? Yes. It would be. Well, it'd be about a hundred pounds for you. Uh, really? Is it... it seems a bit ch cheap for what it does. Oh, there, one hundred and thirty pounds. No, yeah. that's not. That's one hundred and thirty-eight thousand eight hundred eighty-six pounds were pledged, or something. Oh, okay. <laughs> Whatever oh, okay. that means. <laughs> yes. Um, they got some sort of project you see going on. Indeed. Uh, oh, there's another whole lot. Actually, yeah, I might have the same price. With a, it might be two hundred and thirty thousand. <laughs> oh right, no, why? Why is it two hundred and fifty-three? No, it, I don't know. it's obviously the very beginning of whatever they're doing. They've only got two hundred and fifty-three backers with only twenty-eight days to go, so you can put your money in by clicking on there. <clears throat> I think I'm in exactly the same site as you are because I've got that movie of the iPhone Pro as well. Oh, there's probably one here as well. Oh, look at that. Yes. Great memories don't just happen during the day. But how can you capture those precious moments at night in full color 2K? Introducing DualVox Mate Pro, the world's most advanced AI powered night vision camera. Equipped with Sony's groundbreaking Bionic Starvis 2 night vision sensor, DualVox Mate Pro captures night as if it were day. Shoot real time video with unparalleled. There are plenty more of that if you want to see that. I want to move on though because it's already 11.30 um, to US Navy shoots down drone using all electric laser for the first time, which sounds a bit weird. So here we are. Uh, though I'm being very brutal, why don't the uh, uh, we or the NATO or even the customer, why don't they just put a missile straight through Newton's uh, parade, which is on the 9th of this month. Uh, yes, what a good idea, yes. <laughs> He's got all, all his military equipment going through M Moscow. Uh, they're all mock-ups and they're made of cardboard. Oh, that's, right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, it's shot down the first drone representing a subsonic cruise missile using an all-electric high-energy laser. Oh, God, if that went in the wrong direction, it would be awful, wouldn't it? Um, Chloe, you need so much power for these things that it's not really very practical. No, I'm, I'm sure you're absolutely right. Generator is almost the size of that ship, I suspect. I wonder if it tells you here how much. Um, yes. Uh, well, it doesn't really say, in addition to laser, it can be scaled back to disabled sensors. Yes, I see. Um, so, 
Hmm. The USS Ponce. What a name! Um, uh, it doesn't say anything about a power, does it? Anywhere. No mention of that. And the British have tried out a lot of lasers for firing down various things, aircraft ones. But yeah. Those, you could only just get it in the aircraft. <laughs> if you took a, a VC-10, the whole of the VC-10... Oh, gosh. ...cargo area would be taken up with a generator, generating... And then you only need it for a microsecond or a very short space of time. It takes enormous power to get there. Yes, yes, I understand. The USS Ponce. Hmm. Whatever's that about? <laughs> oh, it's the same. Oh, no. Oh, is that the laser? Oh, it is, isn't it? It does look that way. I didn't know that was going to come then. Yes, I see. Um, it go, light, the laser goes from the weapon of tomorrow to the weapon of today. Da 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 da. Called the laws. Right. Maybe it give you the power here. Um, does it uh, have to put power into it? This is divided being able to engage targets at the speed of light, not requiring ammunition, being able to operate of so long as power is available, and has a cost per round of about a dollar per shot. Well, yes, much cheaper. Only a dollar a shot. You wouldn't think there'd be a lot of uh, problem generated, would you? No, and a considerable saving when an area where munitions cost thousands or even millions apiece. Yes, um, yes. Wonder if it shows you about the power generated for it. Um, The Ponce, what a name, Ponce. <laughs> um, oh, oh, somebody wants to talk to me. No, oh, it's only a, a, a notification. I've, my mobile phone's just sitting next to me, buzzing away. Um, forward staging base deployed in the Arab Gulf. Oh, they're not far away, are they? Um, a powerful, affordable. It's, again, it doesn't mention where they generate the power. No, indeed. I've got a YouTube video. I didn't notice that before. So that would look like... Oh, uh, November of the ages, 2014. I think it speeded up the film, wasn't it? When the radar scan around at that speed, you break it to pieces. Right, yes. Destroy ordnance mounted aboard surface weapon. Oh, yes. That's the normal way of trying these things. Yes. Surface Splat. What were those other splashes? I don't know. Things that it blew off, perhaps. Oh, maybe. Then it was gone, yes. Why are they showing us the boat? Oh. Oh, I see. They're firing on the top of that. Oh. Yeah, ah! oh dear. Well, this will be um, a, a drone they're firing at, I suppose. I think so. There it goes, yes. <clears throat> Thank goodness that's finished. Right, I'm moving on. I'm going to move on now. I don't think we want to go anymore. This was a peculiar one. Uh, Ultralight liquid hydrogen <coughs> tank. I read that wrong. Ultralight liquid hydrogen tanks. 
And I thought it was a special form of hydrogen that was ultra light <laughs> to start with. <clears throat> um, promise to make object fuel obsolete. <clears throat> so there's the tank, able to be lifted up like that. <clears throat> this is extraordinary. Uh, <clears throat> developing ultra lightweight cryogenic hydrogen tanks. That partnership, um, yes. I can't read the bottom bit. The hydrogen electric aircraft. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so weight is the energy. <clears throat> sure with hydrogen, that's one of the things that leaks through metal and anything, doesn't it? Yes, that's right. <clears throat> Superior energy storage will make a attractive alternative to lithium. <clears throat> um, now I see it's memory is found, found making similar claims to fuel storage side. I've been working for many years on developing ultra lightweight cryogenic tanks <clears throat> made from graphite fiber, amongst other materials. Um, 75% weight reduction. Uh -huh. They've tested leak tight, even through several cryothermal pressure cycles. <clears throat> That's really what you need to know, isn't it, Richard? Oh, That's the important bit. Yeah, the technology technology readiness level of six plus. Mm, very good. <clears throat> you use it in cars if it was uh, if you get a suitable thing to store it in. Yes, quite. Well, so. Isn't that where aircraft are heading as well? Yes. Yes, they were talking about a hydro hydrogen electric aircraft just just in a book earlier, didn't they? Um, so the weight reduction would make an enormous difference when dealing with fuel like liquid hydrogen, which weighs so little in its own right. To put this into context, zero avias vial valve whatever told us in twenty twenty that for a typical compressed gas. Hydrogen tank, the typical mass fraction was 10 to 12, 11%. Every kilogram of hydrogen, in other words, needs 9 kilograms of tank. But uh, presumably this system doesn't need that much. Um, could allow hydrogen planes to beat regular kerosene jets on range. Even at a 30% mass reduction, mass fraction, which is relatively achievable. You have the utility of a hydrogen system higher um, than a jet fuel system per kilogram basis. Mm, so there you are, you see. 2.4 metres long, da, 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 weighs 12 kilograms with a skirt and a vacuum dewer cell added. Oh, I see. Mm. The total weight 148 pounds or 67 kilograms. And it can hold 150 kilograms of hydrogen. Oh, that's amazing. Um, 157 kilograms of hydrogen. I think that must be somewhat compressed. Being a liquid form, wouldn't it? Oh, well, uh, yeah, I suppose it would, yes. Um, that compresses it a lot, doesn't it? Massively disruptive, mass fraction of 50%, yes. I will clean aircraft fly four times as far as comparable aircraft running on jet fuel. Hmm. Well, all in the future, I fancy. A typical de Havilland Canada Dash, which flies 50 to 60, 56 passengers on a 968 miles on jet fuel, retrofitted with a fuel cell powertrain. The same plane could fly 2,789 miles. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder if they've done that. Well, um, would they, wouldn't they crow about it if they did? No, not possibly. It says could fly, see, yes. Um, you see, I mean, when you actually take this, this what the tanks look like in aircraft, they yeah. don't need to lend themselves to doing what they suggested there. You mean duo cell wings? Well, yeah, that and the fact the shape, because normally a lot of the tanks are fitted in the wings of the aircraft. Yes, of course. Well, that's a funny shape. Does that mean you've got to make those tanks that sort of shape? 
Well, now, that's a very good question, Richard. Would you like to ask High Point and Stroke GTL and find out? Of course. <laughs> but... <laughs> I'm sure they've thought of it. Um... I'm sure they have. Well, That's probably why they haven't done it. Uh, well, there's another link here we could look at. Uh, what does that look like? Um, I just... Uh, I'm sure it doesn't say really, does it? There's the same picture, the same guy. Whiz down at the bottom. Um, well, it's like carbon fibre, as it says. Um, it could be made any shape, couldn't it? You would think so, yes, but then... How much does the pressure inside it depend on its shape? And yeah, if you make something the wrong shape, it will burst. Oh yes, because you're putting it under high pressure. Yes, yes, that's what you're getting at. Well, you make the aircraft to fit round it. Ah, I hadn't thought of that. Yes, <laughs> to re re re-engineer your aircraft. <laughs> mm. hang, hang the aircraft underneath on a piece of string, do you? Just like <laughs> the engine and the tank. At least, yeah, right, I'm going to get rid of that. Um, right, now, this is the next one, I think. Um, low, large genetic study confirms link between brisk walking and slower ageing. I thought that was a very good thing. Um, I remember it talks about a 10-minute walk in your 40s and so forth of being very good for you later on in life. And when we ran the shop, I had to count up the money at the end of the day Sheila had gone home to cook, and I walked back every day through the close, a good 10-minute walk at high speed. I always walked as fast as I could. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that that's the reason why I'm so beautifully young. Well, there's certainly, I think. <laughs> what do you think, <laughs> Diana? <laughs> oh, well, I wouldn't like to comment. <laughs> Fair enough. I was uh, just thinking that... Well, what I was doing in my 40s, and I don't think I was running around briskly at that stage of my life. Mm, you're right, okay. But, um, yes, I just did it once a day, of course, coming back from the shop. Uh, I never thought of it as being going to be long, prolonging my life. I just wanted to get, get my food. <laughs> that was a good incentive, you might say. Um, you, you haven't got any way of measuring it, have you, really? Well, yes, it says the here the interesting study probing the links between gait, speed, and health, demonstrating how walking more slowly in your forties correlates with biological indicators of accelerated aging, such as a lower total brain volume. I mean, I've always walked fast. Yeah. So, it, it, because we never had a car at home when I lived in England, right? And we used to. My mum used to charge down the road and we'd all rush along behind her. So I, I became a fast walker. Yes, <laughs> yes. So you're probably all right. Um, Hopefully. So you, <laughs> um, Ten minutes of brisk walking per day could increase someone's life expectancy by as much as three years. I'll probably use mine up by now. Um, <laughs> I've now tapped into genetic data to confirm what they say is a causal link. Right, so strong predictor of health status. We have not been able to confirm that by adopting a brisk walking pace, it actually causes better health. In this study, we use information contained in people's genetic profile to show that a faster walking pace is indeed likely to lead to a younger biological age, as measured in t whatever that is, telomeres. Oh, those well, walking walking's always good for you, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. And I'm doing uh, well over 3,000 per day now. Um, did 5,000 yesterday and 6,000 the day before, for instance. We're going to uh, steps now, I presume, not miles. Yeah, I, I, mean, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I only did, what, three miles to do 5,000 steps. So it's a, there is a correlation between numbers of steps and distance. Yes, true. So <laughs> how, how long does that take you? Uh, oh, well... Uh, that my machine on my com my my uh, mobile phone says a quarter of an hour or something silly. I never quite. I've, I've done three hours today. Have you already? Oh, of course it's late for you, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm going to bed soon. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's quarter to midday here, so we're almost almost at the end of our talk today. But yes, um, three uh, three hours walking. 
Mm. Did, how long do you know how far that was? No, um, no, not really. Um, was any of it uphill? Yeah. <laughs> You sound to me like um, where you're living, Canberra, is an ideal place to live. In, it's, in many... it's pretty good. Yeah, yes. Yes, they all speak English. and uh... <clears throat> Yeah. Well, my parents were both. They met in a walking club, so it's in my genes. Oh, right. Yes. Very good. <laughs> that did not happen to my parents, no. But my father cycled at home from work up a steep hill every evening. Yeah, but it's still got angina. So, but then mm. I did as well. So that must be just a genetic. Um, there was a genetic uh, thing on the radio I listened to about um, genes and the correlation between fat. They're trying to find the fat gene, and they found these gene, uh, a gene that uh, is responsible. Um, and there were the two varieties of it. If you in it, if you lent on one, if you went to one side of it, you were most likely to become ob obese and if you're the other side you weren't and so uh, if you're on the wrong side you're not able to have reduced thinness or you are liable to be fat and so it is with um, um, granddaughter she's got that problem and so are all her family <laughs> really uh, her father's family I should say not her father's family that's not right the grandfathers? Oh, I can't remember. But all them, all them in a living round Queensland are all rather obese, I'm told. So they have nothing to do. And you're saying they can't help it because it's in the genes. Yeah, exactly. At least that's what they say. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Next one. Ah, to go coffee cups. Shed trillions of plastic particles under normal use. That doesn't sound good at all, does it, Richard? No, not at all. I wouldn't. How do they manage to shed bits? Um, well, I think it's when it breaks, breaks down itself. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever done it, I put a carrier bag in, in my greenhouse. Within six months, it's just powder. Is it? Oh, is that the ultraviolet light and stuff? Yep, absolutely. Well, anyway, it says a new study shows that coffee cups lined with plastic film on the inside can release trillions of particles into the boiling water. Ah, I see, you can't get... Then you drink them. And then you drink them, yeah. Mm. I don't try. I try not to have plastic stuff. Quite, we all try. But we, you try buying food without plastic. It's enormous. Uh, I'm. I'm. No, by the no. way, by the way, Richard, I'm. I'm taking part in a, a count the plastic you throw away for a week. Um, there's a. I think there's a, a series of lists, and you click tick the list of what you're throwing away. Very interesting. I know that my my blue bin which I put plastic bits in, absolutely chock a block. It's absolutely bursting at the moment, where then I've got people here. But the trouble is, I find with the blue bins, by the time I've had four parcels from Amazon, <laughs> the bin is put up with paper and cardboard. Yes, indeed. So, do you separate out soft plastics from hard plastics? Uh, well, the, the thin ones that goes on top of fruit and so on, the very thin film, we separate yeah. the, I separate those out from the harder ones. Because we've got a different place that we take the soft plastics to. Uh, well, what we do is put them in with the general, general waste, so it's not recycled. Oh, ours is recycled. And we, okay. yeah, we take it down to... Uh, a supermarket and they they deal with it yeah right i think it says in this country they can't recycle the thin plastics that's they, right they can't recycle the black plastic trays yeah so i know it's crazy isn't it you only recycle the ones that are any color other than black yeah but, anyway so that, that's a little bit of a worrying thing a cups are exposed to boiling water 20 minutes to count the tiny plastic particles uh, to, to, to spray, yes, the left behind particles just nanometers in size um, cause them to swell in size. I see to, oh, it's a way to measure them. Yes, they reveal trillions of particles in the water sample. Sorry, isn't the recycling of black plastic or the inability a lot to do with the fact that the machines that identify these things can't pick out the black plastic because it's black? Yes, that's true. Yeah, yes. 
you'd think a tweet could put that right, wouldn't you? Anyway, um, so this is how they counted all the plastic. Uh, the main takeaway here is that plastic particles are wherever you look. Trillions per litre. We don't know if they have a bad effect on humans and people. Ah, it's terrible, isn't it? Have you seen the advert on the telly that a woman who's doing exploratory work for plastics in the sea said she had 29 of the 33 banned or dangerous chemicals in her body? No, I didn't see that. Oh, it's, it's right on one of the adverts they're putting out. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, hmm. So anyway, this is this article is worrying enough. <laughs> so what's going to happen to all this? She's done nothing. She's just been looking for plastics in the sea. Yeah, and she's contaminated now. <laughs> yes. yes, absolutely. Right, I'll just move on to one more. Full night vision. I think this is the same thing. Yes, I, I thought I'd done duplicated it. Yeah, sorry about that. But this one I thought you might like, um, particularly Diana. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like cats, Diana? We used to have cats, but my granddaughter's very allergic to oh, dear. things. And she has to carry an EpiPen with her oh. when she's only five. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, oh. she was in hospital the other week with uh, severe asthma. I like so, this picture, though. Feet around there. <laughs> Typical. We used to have cats until then. And oh, yeah. we're not getting any more because of this granddaughter. Yes, very, very wise, yes. Um, I know that the person we bought our shop from was very allergic to cats, and so she could never come to around our, to our house because we had three cats. Um, mm. So she, anyway, um, waking up at 4am with a cat, that's a bit annoying, isn't it? Um, I wake up about 4am anyway. Of course you do, of course you do. I do. <laughs> I know, you keep telling us you do. <laughs> that's why I go to bed so early. <laughs> Well, <laughs> it's so stone there. Why do some cats want to play in the wee are so they the times that you have to get up to go to the toilet? Yes, of course, of course, that's what it says there. Yes, <laughs> well, hmm. talking of getting up, um, I always find I go to sleep quite easily and then I wake up 10 to 15 minutes later and then I find it very hard to get back to sleep. Not <laughs> alone. Sorry, you're not alone. Oh, really? Oh. Uh, I have that too. Oh, it's very irritating. Fine. I've never been a good sleeper. I was probably a nightmare of a child with my parents. They couldn't ever get me to sleep. And the strange thing is, if you put me on an aeroplane, I will go to sleep almost as soon as I'm on there. The drone of the engines puts you to sleep. Well, look at you. I can never sleep at all on an aeroplane. <laughs> That's why I don't have any trouble going to Australia. Apart from waking up with a hard bottom, everything's fine. <laughs> anyway, there's a lot more about cats. They're hungry. Uh, it's all about us. That's the reason why they're getting up at four, is it? You can train your cat to associate something else with getting fed, such as saying breakfast time. Oh, yes. Oh, well, I haven't, I haven't really read through this article. The cats love predictability. Does it? Do they? Uh, oh, look at that. Find the cat. <laughs> mm, mm, yes. Oh, that's a good one, isn't it? That's a good, good article for putting silly pictures of cats in. <laughs> I didn't see any of yours in the camera club like that yet, though, Peter. No, well, you're not going to, are you? Because I don't have a cat. Oh, I'm not going to get a cat. We always left uh, cats. We we used to have two for quite a long time. We used to lock them in the other uh, the other end of the house, so we could, we wouldn't they wouldn't have woken us up anyway. Yeah. Oh, we locked we locked ours in the kitchen downstairs, and we wouldn't have heard them either. They were able to come and go through the cat flap through the night. So if they wanted to wake up at four, they just go outside. We we we're not allowed to have cats anymore unless they're kept in the house. Really? Oh, I suppose that's yeah. in uh, the whole of Australia. Um, Canberra. I uh, don't know about the whole of Australia, but Canberra. Um, so they they can have a cat run in the garden, but they're not allowed 
because of the native animals they they're not allowed out anymore right okay right now just this next one this next screen is just the uh, latest um links to what we're doing so today is uh, here so the next one is the 27th of may and then the 24th of june no, so I won't be at the 27th of may right but there's all the other ones there as well i can all, i can i can put that link onto my thing that i send because it's easier then for you to find it isn't it well i don't have put my google in the bookmarks <laughs> It comes up instantly. Oh, very good, yes. But not, not everyone's able to do that, you know. Oh, that's very true. <laughs> oh, I'm finding it diff more and more difficult in life these days with all these extra bits you have to do when you have a website. <laughs> anyway, stop.